So this past week, on Tuesday, December 3rd, 2019, the Democratic-led House Intelligence Committee released a report, okay, containing a summary of the evidence it has collected in the impeachment inquiry of the first Russian president of the United States, Donald John Trump. The 300-page report cited two instances of misconduct by Donald Trump. One, obstruction of the House inquiry uh, uh, investigation. Two, withholding an official White House meeting and U.S. military aid from Ukraine on the condition of investigating a Trump political rival. Okay, now, Representative Adam Schiff, Democrat of California, who's the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, said, quote, this report chronicles a scheme of the President of the United States to coerce an ally, Ukraine, that, that is at war with an adversary, Russia, into doing the uh, Donald Trump's political dirty work. Okay? He said this at a press conference outlining his committee's findings. Now, the House Intelligence Committee voted 13 to 9 in a closed door meeting on Tuesday, December 3rd, 2019, to send the report to the House Judiciary Committee, which will, which uh, started proceedings this past Wednesday. While the uh, report, which was also prepared by the House Oversight and Foreign Affairs Committees, did not explicitly include recommendations of articles of impeachment, it strongly implies that obstruction of justice could be one of the articles of impeachment. The report noted that past presidents who were the subject of impeachment inquiries, unlike Donald Trump, because they had a better understanding of the Constitution, and even though, you know, they violated the Constitution, they still had some type of integrity. Even Richard Nixon had some type of integrity, but Donald Trump doesn't have any. The, the, these past presidents complied with subpoenas and requests for information from Congress on obstruction of justice, which was described as a, quote, campaign of intimidation, end quote, campaign of intimidation. The report from the House Intelligence Committee cast Trump's efforts to flout congressional oversight as unprecedented because of his refusal to hand over documents and make certain witnesses available. That's obstruction of justice. But, it's, but it also noted that, quote, the House gathered overwhelming evidence. The House Intelligence Committee gathered overwhelming evidence of Donald Trump's misconduct from courageous individuals who were willing to follow the law, end quote. The report goes on to say, no other president has flouted the Const Constitution and power of Congress to conduct oversight to this extent. Quote, if left unanswered. President Trump's ongoing effort to thwart Congress and thwart Congress impeachment power risks doing grave harm to the institution of Congress. The balance of power between our, our branches of government and the constitutional order that the president and every member of Congress have sworn to protect and defend. End quote. They, they take an oath not to a president. They're not, the, the Congress is not subjects of the king. They take an oath to defend the Constitution against enemies, both foreign and domestic. So you have an enemy of the Constitution, enemy of the state, if you will, in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue right now. So the report also constructed a detailed timeline of Donald Trump's alleged efforts to withhold military assistance that was approved by Congress, $391 million approved by Congress to aid Ukraine, as well as an official invitation to the Ukrainian new president, Vladimir Zelensky, to meet with Donald Trump in the White House. This timeline was based on the testimony of various aides and diplomats who have been questioned by impeachment investigators. Ukraine, quote, desperately wanted and needed, end quote, U.S. security assistance, as well as a White House meeting between its president, Vladimir Zelensky, and Donald Trump, Representative Adam Schiff, chair of the House Intelligence Committee, said. Adam Schiff went on to say, quote, at the same time, there was something President Trump desperately wanted and believed that he needed. And that was an investigation that would damage the rival that he feared the most, Joe Biden. An investigation that would damage the rival he feared the most, Joe Biden. As well as an investigation into a debunked conspiracy theory 
that it was Ukraine, not Russia, that interfered in our last election. So we see that conspiracy theory being fed by um, uh, Russian oligarch uh, Konstantin Kalimnik to Paul Manafort and from Paul Manafort to Donald Trump. And we see uh, some U.S. senators like this idiot in Louisiana, in Louisiana, Senator John Kennedy, repeating this debunked conspiracy theory to take pressure off of Russia. So as Nancy Pelosi said this past week, all roads lead to Russia. All roads lead to Russia and Vladimir Putin. So the report from the House Intelligence Committee included a number of new details that stemmed from AT&T phone records obtained by uh, the House of Representatives, which showed someone who was using a phone number associated with the Office of Management and Budget, the OMB, called the president, they called the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, who just got back from the Ukraine, once again chasing these conspiracy theories on behalf of his client, Donald John Trump. And Trump just recently said he didn't know if uh, Rudy Giuliani was still his attorney. Rudy said he, Rudy just got back, he said he was doing this on behalf of his client, Donald Trump. So somebody has amnesia. So somebody, somebody needs to take advantage of uh, Obamacare and go get this checked out. Somebody has amnesia. Per, uh, Donald Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, in early August during the period when the U.S. aid to Ukraine was frozen. That same day, call records show Rudy Giuliani also called the White House Situation Room five times as well as the OMB number. Why is... Why is Rudy Giuliani, who doesn't work for the White House. Well, I mean, let me, let me rephrase that. Rudy Giuliani has no position in federal government. He doesn't work for the White House. He's Donald Trump's personal attorney. He don't work for the White House. He, he, he's not a federal employee. Why is he calling the Situation Room? Why is he calling the Office of Management and Budget? To freeze the security assistance which was announced to to the uh, which was announced to Trump administration officials on July 18th, and not reversed until September 11th, 2019. Donald Trump inquired about the aid in mid June, and around July 12th, quote directed that a hold be placed end quote on the aid to Ukraine. The report said directed that a hold be placed end quote on the aid to Ukraine. Said and as M MSNBC just reported the last couple of days. About all of the money was not even released to Ukraine. It's about $35 million that has not been released. The money was only released after they got caught. Because the, uh, September 9th, the whistleblower reported what was going on. One, two, uh, uh, Democrats in the House of Representatives launched an investigation on September 11th. After the whistleblower blew the whistle, and after the investigation was launched, then... Trump releases the money. So you got Republicans like uh, Representative uh, Jim Jordan of Ohio who needs to be voted out of office. And uh, Representative uh, uh, Mark Meadows of North Carolina. And Kevin McCarthy. Okay. And, and Matt Gates of, of Florida. Okay. Who are saying, hey, you know, the money was released. Wait, wait a second. You didn't release all the money, number one. And you only released it after you got caught. So... During, um, let me back up here. All right, so in making the decision to move forward, we were struck by the fact that the Donald Trump's misconduct was not an isolated occurrence. This ain't just a one-off. Keep in mind, the July 25th telephone call that Trump had with uh, President of the Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, that happened the day after Robert Mueller testified in front of Congress. Because Trump thought he got away with it. So he continued to do it. He thought he got away with it, so he continued to do it. This man, is something wrong with this fool. I tried to tell you in 2016, this dude ain't wrapped too tight. There's something wrong with him. In making the decision to move forward, we were struck by the fact that Donald Trump's misconduct was not an isolated occurrence, nor was it the product of a naive president. Quote, President Trump does not appear 
to believe there is any such limitation on his power to use White House meetings, military aid, or other official acts to procure foreign help in his re-election, end quote. So you have Republicans saying it's too close to the, to the next election. Let's just uh, leave it up to the voters. Wait, wait a second, hold on. The, Senate, the, the, the Republicans in the Senate have chosen three times not to pass legislation to secure the integrity of the next election. You talking about that election you want people to, you, you, want, you want to leave it up to voters to vote in that election? But, but you have a duty under the Constitution to hold a president accountable and you want to kick the can down the street and you don't want to do your job? Is that what you're trying to say? If you don't want to do your job, you shouldn't have a job. So we saw that Trump openly welcomed help from Russia in the 2016 election, and he got it. We saw that he was interviewed by George Stephanopoulos, George Stephanopoulos on ABC, and he was asked the same question. Wait a second. You know, if a foreign country reached out to you and they said, we have dirt on your opponent, you know, what would you do? He said, I think you would hear them. I think you would hear them out. He said, you know, maybe you call it FBI. I think you would hear them out. See, one thing about Trump, everything he does, he told you he was going to do it. So you can't say he didn't tell you. Everything he does, he told you he was going to do it. So you can't sit there and act surprised because he told you he was going to break the law. He told you he was going to shred the Constitution. He told you that based upon Article 2 of the Constitution, and I guarantee you this fool hasn't read it, he said he could do whatever he wants to. I just don't talk about it. So everything he does, he told you he was going to do it. The question is, what are you going to do? The question is, what are you going to do? Quote, President Trump does not appear to believe there is any such limitation on his power to use White House meetings, military aid, or other official acts to procure foreign help in his re-election, end quote. The president's conduct, which, which put, quote, his own personal and political interests above the interests of the American people, end quote, exact, is exactly why they prescribed a remedy as extraordinary as the remedy of impeachment, Representative Adam Schiff said, chair of the House Intelligence Committee. Adam Schiff went on to say, we have a difficult decision ahead of us to make. And he explained that it will be a decision made by the House Judiciary Committee. And they're going to make the decision this week. They're going to impeach his ass, which they should have done months ago. Okay? So the report from the House Intelligence Committee puts the White House summary of Donald Trump's July 25, 2019 phone call with Ukraine's president at the center of the inquiry, calling it, quote, stark evidence of misconduct, end quote. Stark evidence of misconduct. And quote, a demonstration of the president's prioritization, prioritization of his personal political benefit over the national interest, end quote. But the report claimed this conversation was, quote, neither the start nor the end of President, Trump, President Trump's efforts to bend U.S. foreign policy for his personal gain. That's an impeachable offense right there. The report claimed this conversation was, quote, neither the start nor the end of President Trump's efforts to bend U.S. foreign policy for his personal gain. End quote, which means it doesn't, doesn't again. Rather, it was a dramatic crescendo within a months-long campaign driven by Donald Trump in which senior U.S. officials, including Vice President uh, uh, Mike Pence, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, the Acting Chief of Staff, uh, Mick Mulvaney, okay, who used to be over the Office of Management and Budget, the Secretary of Energy, um, uh, Rick Perry, okay, and others were either knowledgeable of or active participants in an effort to extract from a foreign nation the personal political benefits sought by Donald Trump, the report stated. Now, during his Tuesday remarks, Tuesday, December 3rd, 2019, Representative Adam Schiff, chair of the House Intelligence Committee, said Americans should care deeply about whether the president is, quote, betraying their trust in him, end quote, 
and betraying the oath he took to the Constitution. Now, I ain't had no trust. I, I had the only trust I had in Trump is that he would be a traitor. That's the only trust I had in him. I ain't, I ain't had no faith in him. I, I knew what he was going to do. That's why I tried to warn you. Okay? So, quote, if we don't care about this, we can darn well be sure the president will be back at it doing this all over again, end quote. Now, much of the evidence came from 17 closed-door interviews with key witnesses and over two weeks of public hearings uh, in uh, the month of November with a dozen of those witnesses. In their public testimony, a number of those 12 witnesses confirmed and elaborated on the efforts allegedly made by Donald Trump, his associates, and, administ and administration officials to get Ukraine to announce investigations into those two issues and why they believe uh, delayed U.S. aid to Ukraine would only be released once the nation followed through on these demands. And when you, and when you read this, it was um, uh, Gordon Sondland, if I remember correctly, who testified that they didn't Ukraine didn't even have to really do the investigation into Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. They just had to go on CNN and announce there was an investigation. Because Trump, once again, is trying to use a foreign nation to help him win another election. He did it in 2016. He said he would do it again when he was interviewed by George Stephanopoulos on ABC. And he did it again. Why are you surprised? Republicans on the House Intelligence, the House Oversight and House Foreign Affairs Committees re relayed, uh, released a 123-page minority report this past Monday evening that argues that Democrats have failed to establish any impeachable offenses by Trump. Now, if you just switched all the names around and this was President Obama doing this contact, let's say hypothetically, President Obama contacted Vladimir Putin and said, we'll release sanctions on Russia if you get me dirt on Donald Trump. When Trump was there in, in, in Russia in 2013 with the Miss America pageant, you know, when Trump was in, allegedly in the hotel room with the, you know, the two ladies of the night, what have you, whatever dirt you got on, on, on Trump, if you get that for me, I'll release uh, uh, sanctions that are on Russia, okay? What you think these same Republicans would be out here saying no impeachable offenses, nothing to see here? Oh, aid was released, all this stuff. Just switch the names around and see. If, just, just, just give the Obama test. Switch the names around and see if they would, you, they would come to the same conclusion. So Republicans said there was no. So, um, so they released this little 123-page ridiculous report. Okay, uh, this past Monday. They said that they didn't find that Trump engaged in any wrongdoing and that there was no quid pro quo, even though Gordon Sondland said there was. And Gordon Sondland was, was handpicked by Trump to be, US, be a U.S. ambassador. Gordon Sondland ain't like a holdover from President Obama. That was somebody picked by Trump. Republicans said there was no evidence that Trump improperly withheld $391 million in military aid to Ukraine or pressured Zelensky to investigate Joe Biden to help benefit his 2020 re-election campaign, arguing that much of Trump's actions regarding Ukraine actually stems from his long-standing skepticism about the country due to his history of persuasive corruption. But Donald Trump ain't mentioned corruption in the July 25th, 2019 call with Vladimir Zelensky. He didn't mention corruption then. If he's so concerned about corruption. So I want to go, we're coming up on a break here. Uh, let's squeeze in uh, this first clip. Let's see, this is, we got clip number one here. Highlights, constitutional experts testify at Trump impeachment uh, hearing this past week. Let's go to this clip from NBC News Now. President Trump did not merely seek to benefit from foreign interference in our elections. He directly and explicitly invited foreign interference in our election. America will see why most people don't go to law school. No offense to our professors. But please, really, we're bringing you in here today to testify on stuff that most of you have already written about, all four, for the opinions that we already know, out of the classrooms that maybe you're getting ready for finals in, to discuss 
things that you probably haven't even had a chance to say, unless you're really good on TV and watching the hearings for the last couple of weeks, you couldn't have possibly actually digested the Adam Schiff report from yesterday or the Republican response in any real Pause way. Pause it right there. Pause it right there. And we can be theoretical all we want. Pause it. Okay. Now, that's Representative uh, Doug Collins of Georgia, who in the past couple of days just said they need to delay the, 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 the House Judiciary hearings because he needs time to catch up. On what on on on, uh, uh, on the hearings that just took place. That's Representative Doug Collins of Georgia. He needs to be voted out of office, also Republican. Let's go back to this. We digested the Adam Schiff report from yesterday or the Republican response in any real way. Turn up a little. Now we can be theoretical all we want, Thanks. but the American people is really going to look at this and say, "Huh?" The basis of the testimony and the evidence before the House, President Trump has committed impeachable high crimes and misdemeanors by corruptly abusing the office of the presidency. I'm concerned about lowering impeachment standards to fit a paucity of evidence and an abundance of anger. I believe this impeachment not only fails to satisfy the standard of past impeachments, but would create a dangerous precedent for future impeachments. Here, Mr. Collins, I would like to say to you, sir, that I read transcripts of every one of the witnesses who appeared in the live hearing because I would not speak about these things without reviewing the facts. So I'm insulted by the suggestion that as a law professor I don't care about those facts. But everything I read on those occasions tells me that when President Trump invited, indeed demanded foreign involvement in our upcoming election, he struck at the very heart of what makes this a republic to which we pledge allegiance. That demand, as Professor Feldman just explained, constituted an abuse of power. The principle that in this country, no one is king. We have followed that principle since before the founding of the Constitution, and it is recognized around the world as a fixed, inspiring American ideal. This impeachment would rival the Johnson impeachment as the shortest in history, depending on how one counts the relevant days. My kids are mad. Three Even minutes. my dog seems mad. And Loon is a golden doodle, and, and they don't get mad. Will a slipshod impeachment make us less mad? Will it only invite an invitation for the madness to follow every future administration? That is why this is wrong. There are some additional high crimes and misdemeanors that are specifically identified in the text of the Constitution, correct? Yes, that's true. What are they? Treason and bri bribery. Uh, do President Trump's demands on Ukraine also establish the high crime of bribery? Yes, they do. The Mueller report cites a number of facts that indicate the President of the United States obstructed justice. And that's an impeachable offense. A president who will not cooperate in an impeachment inquiry is putting himself above the law. Imagine a bank robbery and the police come and the person's in the middle of bank robbery and the person then drops the money and says, I, I, I'm going to leave without the money. Everybody understands that's, bur that's robbery. I mean, that's burglary. I'll get it right. Yeah. Uh, uh, and in this situation, we've got somebody really caught in the middle of it and that uh, doesn't excuse the person from the consequences. Impeachments have to be based on proof, not presumptions. That's the problem when you move towards impeachment on this abbreviated schedule that has not been explained to me. Why you want to set the record for the fastest impeachment? Did you write an article entitled, It's Hard to Take Impeachment Seriously Now? Yes, I did write that and article. And in that article, in, did, you write, did you write, hold on, I'm limited on time. So, I wrote did you write, article. since, in, since the like 2018 the midterm sir? election, House Democrats have made it painfully clear that discussing impeachment is primarily or even exclusively a tool to weaken President Trump's chances in 2020. Did you write those words? Until this call on July 25th, I was an impeachment skeptic. Very well. changed I, my mind, sir, and for Thank you, reason. I appreciate your testimony. Okay, all right. Okay, so so that was uh, Representative Matt Gates from Florida who needs to be voted out of office also, as well. He's one of Donald Trump's hitchmen, right? He tried to shut the professor up when the professor was trying to explain to him why he now supports impeachment of Donald John Trump. Uh, we'll continue this on the other side of the break because um, uh, Professor Turley, 
who you heard there, who was who was the uh, witness the Republicans brought. He got deconstructed on AM Joy, Joy and Reed show on MSNBC. 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation, the Future Radio, the African History Network show. 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600. Uh, Michael M. Hotel will be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation, WFDF. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday. Uh, December 8th, 2019, and we are live. Call in number 313 778 7600 if you have a question or comment. Okay, so we're continuing our discussion dealing with uh, the impeachment inquiry and what, and what just happened uh, this past week. Uh, we saw the House Intelligence Committee uh, release their 300 page report. I printed up the first 24 pages. I've been reading through that. I'm not sure if I brought it with me or not. I got so much stuff here. Uh, I got, I mean, I got this file here. This is on impeachment inquiry. This, this is well, this is on impeachment. This is one file here, and I got a bunch of other stuff on it. Okay, but the clip that I just played for you, it, it, was that the end of that clip? Okay, the clip I just played for you, that was uh, from NBC News Now, the name of that clip. So that's at NBCNews.com. The name of that clip is, I want you to go watch it again so you can see who was talking. Uh, highlights, constitutional experts testify in Trump impeachment. Highlights, constitutional experts testify in Trump impeachment. That's at NBCNews.com. We'll post that here on the thread of the broadcast also. Okay. All right, so um, you heard uh, Harvard professor uh, Pamela Carlin. Of, uh, I'm sorry, you heard um, Harvard professor Pamela Carlin. Uh, no, she's with Stanford. Uh, Pamela Carlin. You heard Noah Feldman of Harvard University. Uh, you heard uh, Michael Gerhardt of uh, the University of North Carolina and Jonathan Turley, who was the Republican professor. Who, he was the Republican witness that, profess, uh, the, uh, uh, that, they, that Republicans brought. He was the professor that Republicans brought. Uh, Jonathan Turley of George Washington University. So the hearing, which spanned over eight hours uh, on Wednesday, December 4th, 2019, um, featured these... Uh, for constitutional law experts, okay, to give Americans an education on constitutional law because one, Americans are woefully ignorant of history. Two, we don't understand, a lot of Americans uh, haven't read the Constitution, including uh, the one sitting in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and don't really understand constitutional law, don't understand impeachment, etc. Right. So I watched a lot of that eight hour hearing and I mean, it was very, very educational. So a senior Ukrainian official told the uh, New York Times that uh, she so this information came out, I think it was December 3rd. OK, then I'm going to get into what happened December 4th at, at, at that eight hour hearing. Um, a senior, senior Ukrainian official told the New York Times that she and others knew about the hold on military aid in July of 2019, acknowledging for the first time that officials in Kiev were aware of the freeze during the Trump administration's pressure campaign. She said advisors, she said advisors to Ukraine's president sought to keep that fact from surfacing to avoid getting drawn into the American impeachment debate. So all these lies that Trump and his henchmen keep telling, keep being debunked, keep being disproven. Now, Wednesday, December 4th, 2019, was a huge day in the impeachment inquiry. Three prominent legal scholars testified Wednesday that the House Judiciary Committee, at the House Judiciary Committee, that Donald John Trump committed impeachable offenses when he attempted to condition a White House visit by Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and aid to the country on the launching of political investigations into his political rivals, into his political rivals. So if Trump is so um, concerned about corruption, right, one, why hasn't he investigated his own family? Why hasn't he investigated, uh, 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 he investigated Vanka, he investigated his sons, why hasn't he investigated uh, Jared Kushner? If, if he's concerned about corruption. Two, what other, I haven't heard him talk about what other countries he's concerned about corruption in. When, when I listen to all, all of his Republican defenders, they haven't talked about the other countries 
that they're concerned about corruption in and launched investigations into, that Trump has launched investigations into, things like this. So, Wednesday, December 4th, we saw three prominent um, legal scholars testify at the House Judiciary Committee that Donald Trump committed impeachable, impeachable offenses when he attempted to condition a White House visit by Ukrainian president and aid to the country on the launching of political investigations. The hearing, which spanned over eight hours, featured four law professors, okay? Noah Feldman of Harvard, Pamela Carlin of Stanford, Michael Gerhardt of the University of North Carolina, and Jonathan Turley of George Washington University. Mr. Uh, Professor Feldman, Carlin, and Gerhardt were called in by the Democrats. Turley was called in by Republicans, as I stated. One after another, and at times using blistering language, the trio of professors sitting, uh, uh, sitting side by side who were called to testify by Democrats told the committee that according to evidence against Trump that has been made public, Trump was guilty of high crimes and misdemeanors, high crimes and misdemeanors and other impe impeachable actions. So uh, I want to go to, let's see, let's go to, uh, let's go to clip number, I think we're going to clip number two. Clip number two is uh, Lawrence O'Donnell. Yeah, let's go to clip number two. The last word, Lawrence O'Donnell. No Republican contested evidence of Trump's impeachable conduct. Let's go to this clip. Mm -mm. Huh? Okay. Okay, we're going to this clip now. In just a second here. Trump should be impeached. And the fourth says Donald Trump should not be impeached yet. The dissenting law professor at today's hearing, Jonathan Turley, did not actually defend Donald Trump's actions that are currently under investigation. Professor Turley simply argued that the House of Representatives should slow down and spend months fighting in courts to force the testimony of Trump officials who are refusing to testify. And after that, then maybe... Maybe Donald Trump should be impeached. Impeachments require a certain period of saturation and maturation. That is, the public has to catch up. I'm not prejudging what your record would show. But if you rush this impeachment, you're going to leave half the country behind. And certainly that's not what the president, what the framers wanted. You have to give the time to build a record. The three other law professors testifying today, Noah Feldman, Pamela Carlin, and Michael Gerhardt, agreed that the president's unprecedented order to not testify issued to everyone in his administration is, in, in, in and of itself, an impeachable offense as obstruction of Congress. Jonathan Turley did not disagree that it could be an impeachable offense. He just suggested that the Democrats need to spend months in court fighting the president over those witnesses before writing that up as an obstruction article of impeachment. Harvard Law Professor Noah Feldman said that he did not support impeachment efforts against the president until he read the call record of Donald Trump's phone call with the president of Ukraine in which Donald Trump asked the president of Ukraine to announce an investigation of Joe Biden. I'd like to focus the panel on the evidence they considered and the findings in the Intelligence Committee report that the President solicited the interference of a foreign government, Ukraine, in the 2020 U.S. presidential election. Pre Professor Feldman, did President Trump commit the impeachable high crime and misdemeanor of abuse of power based on that evidence and those findings. Based on that evidence and those findings, the president did commit an impeachable abuse of office. Professor Carlin, same question. Same answer. And Professor Gerhardt, did President Trump commit the impeachable high crime and misdemeanor of abuse of power? We three are unanimous. Yes. The three law professors supporting impeachment now repeatedly cited specific points of evidence in making their case. Jonathan Turley never cited evidence in his repeated urging that Congress slow down in its gathering of evidence. Stanford law professor Pamela Carlin went out of her way to cite what she thought was the single most damning line of testimony in the impeachment inquiry. 
I spent all of Thanksgiving vacation sitting there reading these transcripts. I didn't, you know, I, I ate like a turkey that came to us in the mail that was already cooked because I was spending my time doing this. And the most chilling line for me of the entire process was the following. Ambassador Sondland said he had to announce the investigations. He's talking about uh, 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 President Zelensky. He had to announce the investigations. He didn't actually have to do them as I understood it. And then he said, I never heard, Mr. Goldman, anyone say that the investigations had to start or had to be completed. The only thing I heard from Mr. Giuliani or otherwise was they had to be announced in some form. And what I took that to mean was this was not about whether Vice President Biden actually committed corruption or not. This was about injuring somebody who the president thinks of as a particularly uh, a, a particularly hard opponent. No Republican in the room responded in any way to that point raised by Professor Carlin. Jonathan Turley did not say one word about it. All of the Republicans on the committee pretended that Donald Trump withheld $400 million in military aid to Ukraine while he was properly evaluating Ukraine's fitness to receive such aid. Every Republican in the room knows they are all lying about that. They all know that the Defense Department certified Ukraine's suitability for such aid before Donald Trump blocked it. Every Republican in the room pretended that in the end Donald Trump decided to send the aid to Ukraine even though Ukraine did not publicly announce an investigation of Joe Biden and therefore Donald Trump did nothing wrong. Every Republican in the room knows that they are lying about that. Every Republican in the room knows that Donald Trump only only released the aid to Ukraine when the Democrats in the House of Representatives started investigating why Donald Trump was holding up that aid. And every Republican in the room knows that Donald Trump was warned about a whistleblower complaint about this before, before he released the aid to Ukraine. In other words, everyone in that room, Democrat and Republican, knows that Donald Trump released the aid to Ukraine only because he got caught in the act of illegally withholding it. Does it matter, I'll ask all the panelists, does it matter to impeachment that the $391 million U.S. taxpayer dollars in military assistance that the president withheld was ultimately delivered. Professor Feldman, does that matter to the question of impeachment? No, it does not. If, if the president of the United States attempts to abuse his office, that is a complete impeachable offense. The possibility that the president might get caught in the process of attempting to abuse his office and then not be able to pull it off does not undercut in any way the impeachability of the act. If you'll pardon a comparison, President Nixon was uh, subject to articles of impeachment preferred by this committee for attempting to cover up the Watergate break-in. The fact that President Nixon was not ultimately successful in covering up the break-in was not grounds for not impeaching him. The attempt itself is the impeachable act. Soliciting itself is the impeachable offense, regardless whether the other person comes up with it. So imagine that the imagine that the president had said, "Will you do us a seconds. favor? Will you investigate Joe Biden?" And uh, the president of Ukraine said, "You know what? Uh, no, I won't, because we've already looked into this, and it's totally baseless." Um, the president would still have committed an impeachable act, even if he had been refused right there on the phone. One of the things to understand from the history of impeachment is everybody who's impeached has failed. They failed to get what they wanted. And what they wanted was not just to do what they did, but to get away with it. And the point of impeachment is, it's, and it's made possible through investigation, is to not is to catch that person, charge that person, and ultimately remove that person from office. But impeachments are always focusing on somebody who didn't quite get as far as they wanted to. All right. Okay, so that was from uh, The Last Word on MSNBC. You can watch that uh, clip at msnbc.com. Uh, it's entitled, uh, No Republican Contested Evidence of Trump's Impeachable Conduct. Okay, excellent, excellent clip from uh, Lawrence O'Donnell uh, on the last word. Okay, so when we look very briefly here 
And to keep up with a lot of this information, you can go to uh, two good sources. One, NBCNews.com. They have an entire page dealing with impeachment and all the articles one uh, there in one place. Also, uh, New York Times, because I read New York Times, NBC News, Washington Post. I monitor about 35 different news sources daily, okay? Uh, New York Times, they have an impeachment inquiry uh, email, an email newsletter that comes out basically each day. And it comes out in the evening, which gives you a recap of what took place that day dealing with impeachment, okay? So you can read that as well. All right, so what were those high crimes exactly that the professors talked about? Okay. Uh, the hearing uh, turned in large part on the constitutional definitions of abuse of power, bribery, and foreign interference, ideas that the framers of the Constitution considered the grist of any impeachable case. Here are some of the ways that the scholars used those terms to argue for and against impeaching uh, Donald Trump. One, when we look at abuse of power. So, uh, Professor Feldman said Donald Trump's withholding of military aid to Ukraine was critical to the definition of abuse of power as it co uh, combined two central aspects. One, enriching himself and undercutting national security. He said, quote, there's nothing wrong with someone asking for a favor in the interest of the United States of America. The problem is for the president to use his office to solicit or demand a favor for his personal benefit, end quote. Uh, he said of the July 25th call between Donald Trump and Vladimir Zelensky, president of Ukraine. Quote, that's the definition of corruption under the Constitution, end quote. Now, Professor Gerhardt said that uh, Donald Trump's pressure campaign and removal of the American ambassadors to Ukraine, uh, Marie uh, Yabanovich, uh, was, quote, an abuse of power that only the president can commit, end quote. Or, as Professor Feldman put it, to, quote, gain an advantage that is not available to anyone who is not the president, end quote. When we look at bribery, because we know bribery and treason are mentioned in the Constitution, uh, Article 4, uh, sorry, Article 2, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution. Bribery and treason are mentioned. And treason is defined um, in Article 3, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution. Treason, contrary to popular belief, treason is not being loyal to the president. Okay? That's not treason. Treason, treason deals with uh, aiding uh, and providing comfort for a, uh, a foreign government that's an enemy uh, of the U.S. during a time of war during a time of declared war. And we know that war is declared by Congress. Okay? So that's treason. Article 3, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution. Just uh, not being loyal to the president, not liking the president, speaking out against the president, that's not treason. Okay? So, th that, so when, when you have a president saying something like that, that falls more along the line of a dictator. That's not treason based upon the Constitution. That falls more along the line of a dictator, okay? And you can go to LOC.gov, LOC.gov Library of Congress website. You can read the U.S. Constitution there. Also, you can go to um, archives.gov, which is the National Archives. And we look here, because I, you know, I carry the Constitution around with me. Um, the Section 3, treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. The Congress shall have power to declare the punishment of treason, but no attainder of treason shall work, uh, shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attained. Okay, so this so um, treason has nothing to do with not liking the president, saying bad things about the president. That's not treason. All right, bribery. Professor Carlin, uh, the uh, only female on the panel, Pamela Carlin. Professor Pamela Carlin said that Donald Trump committed what the framers believed was bribery regardless of whether he committed what the current federal criminal code establishes as bribery. She said when you ask for private benefits in return for an official act or somebody gave them to you to influence an official act, that was bribery, end quote. So federal 
criminal statutes, federal criminal codes, right, don't have to be violated to commit impeachable offenses by the president. It's not the same standard. You could break those federal statutes, but you don't have to. 9, 10 a.m., can I get a name? Okay. So, Professor Turley uh, argued that, quote, the language of the interpretation of federal courts, end quote, says that Donald Trump did not commit real crimes, a point that a Republican staff lawyer said moved Donald Trump's actions into the category of, quote, misdemeanors. Misdemeanors, okay? Misdemeanors are an impeachable offense as well, okay? Uh, we're coming up on a break. You listen to 9, 10 a.m. Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel, the African History Network show. We'll be back in a few minutes. Credit? All right, stand by, everybody. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Okay, we got Sandy. Uh, racial history more than two centuries after it was designed to empower Southern whites. Electoral College continues to do just that. The current system has a distinct adverse impact on black voters, diluting the political power. Southern states, red states are a prime example. Yeah, all, all that's true, Sandy, but in 2016, there was 16.4 million African Americans registered to vote. Yes, there was rampant voter suppression that took place. I don't think anybody talked about that more on this radio station than I did. Yes, there was Russian interference. I was warning you about that in 2016 and Russian disinformation uh, campaigns because I read the CrowdStrike report and the Fidelis report before the 2016 election, so I warned you about that. But in spite of the cross-checking system, the interstate cross-checking system, was not 1.1 million people off the voter rolls in 2016. 20 and, seconds. And, and, and despite the fact that there were 868 fewer polling places, which I warned you about as well, the, uh, there was a 7 percentage point drop in African American turnout. Seven, Trump won Michigan, six. Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania by 78,000 popular votes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation Feature Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is uh, Sunday, December 8th, 2019, and uh, we are live here. 313-778-7600 is the call in the number. We'll go to the phone lines in just a minute here. Um, let's see, Sandy on Facebook said uh, she talked about the Electoral College. And she said the Electoral College races, uh, racial history more than two centuries after it was designed to empower Southern whites. The Electoral College continues to do just that. Uh, the current system has a distinct adverse impact on black voters, diluting their political power. Southern states, red states are a prime example. Well, so let's break this down. Uh, yeah, the history of the Electoral College. Now, also, the Electoral College was also created by people like Alexander Hamilton because there was a fear of factions breaking out. It wasn't, it wasn't just to empower uh, southern states or to give an advantage to um, uh, slaveholding states, okay? Because it worked along with also the, because of the Electoral College and also because of Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution, known as the Three-Fifths Compromise, which we don't understand as well, which dealt with determining how to count enslaved Africans and slaveholding states to determine how many seats in the House of Representatives slaveholding states would have. So they said for the purpose of taxation and apportionment, that three-fifths of the population would be counted. It didn't say they were three-fifths of a human being. It says three-fifths of the population of enslaved Africans in a particular state would be counted to determine how many seats in the House of Representatives a slaveholding state would have because representation in the House of Representatives is based upon population. So the North is arguing, well, you don't want to, uh, this is determined at the Philadelphia Convention in 1787. The North is arguing, well, you don't want to even count them as human beings. So how are you going to? How, how, so how are you going to uh, uh, count them uh, as one person in determining population, the, the population of a state like Virginia, to determine how many seats in the House of Representatives a particular state has? So they're going back and forth. And, and the North is saying, well, wait a second. If you count the full population of enslaved Africans, that's going to give the South an unfair advantage in the House of Representatives. You just be able to control the House and just get past whatever laws you want in the House of Representatives. 
So they're going back and forth debating this. Some, some say to count half the population. Some say three-quarters of the population. So they decided to count three-fifths of the population of enslaved Africans and slaveholding states. Okay? But the, the way that count was taken was corrected by Section 2 of the 14th Amendment of 1868. Now, with the Electoral College, that deals with presidential elections only, the Electoral College. However, if we understood how our vote is being suppressed and why our vote is being suppressed, specifically African Americans, but not just African Americans, because white college students' votes are suppressed as well with voter ID laws, okay? Hispanics' votes are suppressed as well because there's a fear they'll vote Democratic, all right? But in the 20, 2016 election, you've heard me talk about this before, I do a lecture, African American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and high elections have consequences. I do another presentation, Six Principles of Political Self-Defense, Understanding How Laws and Policies Impact the Economic Conditions of African Americans. 2016 election, well, let's back up to 2012. 2012 record number of African Americans voted. 66.6% of African Americans registered to vote voted in the 2012 president, presidential election that had President Obama on the ballot. So it was uh, close to, it was uh, probably uh, almost 18 million who uh, voted. I'm mean, sorry, of almost 18 million who were registered to vote. 66.6% .6 actually voted. 2013, see, see, what people miss is understanding law. Because a record number of African Americans voted in the 2012 presidential election, what happened was a backlash that, one, we weren't prepared for, two, we still don't understand. Because every city I lectured in this year, I asked people about Shelby County versus Holder, 2013 U.S. Supreme Court case, and most of our people don't know about it. Now, they can tell you what happened with T.I. and Tiny and Hyman Gate. They can tell you what happened on Love and Hip Hop last week. They can tell you about Cardi B and Offset. But they can't tell you what offset the 2016 election. Shelby County versus Holder, U.S. Supreme Court case, 2013, was a backlash by Republicans to a record number of African Americans coming out to vote in the 2012 presidential election. What it did was good at Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act in 1965 that we still don't understand. The Voting Rights Act, the House of Representatives this past week, led by Democrats, and they were basically the only ones who voted for it, because it was something like 193 Republicans that voted against strengthening and securing the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Imagine that. But Section 5 dealt with oversight. Oversight dealt with those states that had a history of putting obstacles in the way of African Americans voting. Most of them former Confederate states like Alabama and Georgia, Mississippi, okay? But in states where you had to have poll taxes, where you had to be able to, like in Mississippi, the, 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 there were, uh, I think, something like 282 um, sections to the Mississippi State Constitution. To be able to register to vote in Mississippi, African Americans had to be able to explain to the satisfaction of the registrar one of the 282 sections of the Mississippi State Constitution. If you, if you watch Eyes on the Prize, they talk about this in Eyes on the Prize. Literacy tests, things like this. It was not illegal to vote for African Americans in these, in these southern states. What they did was they put obstacles in the way of you voting. So Section 5 of the 1965 Voting Rights Act put the preclearance, pre and uh, that, that dealt with preclearance, and that provided federal oversight. So any of these states that had a history of putting obstacles in the way of African Americans to vote, if they wanted to make any changes, to the number of polling places that would uh, would be available for an election, to the number of hours polling places would be uh, open, to the number of weekends that you can have souls to the poll voting when many African Americans go vote after Sunday church. Any changes, you had to get clearance from a federal judge. Well, what Shelby County versus Holder 2013 Supreme Court case did as a backlash to a record number of African Americans coming out to vote in 2012, it, it gutted Section 5, it weakened it, so now those states did not have to have 
permission from a federal judge. So immediately after that, now all these states come out with new, new laws, new voter ID laws, new voter suppression tactics, because now they don't need preclearance from a federal judge. So in the 2016 uh, presidential election, that was the first election in 50, first presidential election of 50 years that you did not have the full power or the full weight of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that most of African Americans today still don't understand. And there were 868 fewer polling places in 2016. Many of those polling places were shut down in African American communities. There were 868 fewer places you could vote in 2016. Today, there's 1,700 fewer polling places, which goes back to Shelby County versus Holder. Where, what state is Shelby County in? Alabama. Alabama was the ground, ground zero. Selma, Alabama. Ground zero for the fight for the voting rights after 65. So because we didn't understand history, because we didn't understand law, because we don't understand, we don't understand politics, we did not we did not anticipate the backlash from the turnout in 2012. So when Shelby County versus Holder took place in 2013, most of us don't even know it existed. So then we don't understand how that influenced the 2016 election when you had a 7 percentage point drop in the percentage of African Americans registered to vote who actually turned out the vote. People think, uh, well, it was because uh, I saw... Um, uh, on MSNBC this past week, and who is it? Uh, uh, one of the, uh, I can't get, sometimes I mix all the white ladies up, because uh, <laughs> it gets so many of them on MSNBC. But <laughs> it was, um, I forgot which one it was. She was sitting there for somebody, and she said uh, African Americans didn't vote because they, they, they weren't happy with Hillary Clinton. Okay? There was, quote unquote, a lack of enthusiasm for some. But that wasn't all that was that that wasn't all that was involved. There was rampant voter suppression coming from Republicans, and there was a direct disinformation campaign from Russia attacking African Americans as well to suppress the vote, to get them not to vote, or get them not to vote for Hillary Clinton, i.e., vote for Jill Stein, or in some places cases vote for Donald Trump or stay at home. If you read Volume One of the Mueller report. If you read volume one of the Mueller report, it talks about, one of the things they talk about with the Russian interference is how African Americans were attacked in the 2016 election. If you read the State of Black America report, 2019, from the uh, uh, National Urban League, it talks about how African Americans were attacked as well, okay, in the uh, 2016 election. I just saw it also. Um, what was her name? Jan... Uh, MS, uh, MSNBC, uh, I forgot her name. Uh, she was sitting there for somebody else. I think she was sitting there for, I think she was sitting there for Hallie Jackson or somebody on MSNBC, I forgot. But she talked about this. So usually, I notice on MSNBC, usually when they talk about what happened in 2016 and uh, a downturn in African Americans voting, right? They don't talk about voter suppression targeting African Americans. And then uh, uh, Chris Chris Jansen, that's her name, Chris Jansen. She said that. Chris Jansen, this past week on MSNBC. Okay? And they also don't talk about how we were targeted with a disinformation campaign by Russia. And it's going to continue in 2020. So if you don't understand what happened in 2016, then you're right to get your behind kicked again in 2020. Because they're going to use a lot of the same tactics. They're going to use a lot of the same tactics because you need to figure out the, you need to figure out the trick in 2016. All right, so, uh, so we have to study, we have to understand that it's the vote by state that matters. That's why, they were, that's why Republicans were targeting, uh, a, a, that's why they were targeting a lot of battleground states, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Donald Trump won Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania by 78,000 electoral college votes. He won Michigan by 10,704 votes. There were 54,000 people knocked off the voter rolls in Michigan because of the interstate cross-checking system. 
which was used in something like 23 states where Republicans dominated the state legislature and, and the governorship. And the interstate cross-checking system knocked 1.1 million people off the voter rolls. Now, most people don't even know this stuff exists. So if you, ain't, if you, didn't, if you don't understand what happened in 2016, because you don't understand how crucial the Voting Rights Act is and the impact that Shelby County versus Holder 2013 U.S. Supreme Court case had, and you don't understand what, 2000, what happened in 2012, then how are you going to understand what's going to happen in 2020 and the importance of 2020? This is understanding history and law. All this deals with history and law. Who chooses Supreme Court nominations? Who, who chooses Supreme Court nominations? The president. Who confirms Supreme Court nominations? The U.S. Senate. Who chooses federal judges? Who nominates them? The president. If you just saw what happened this past week, they just announced Republicans in the U.S. Senate have uh, confirmed 170 federal judges it, 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 that Donald Trump has nominated, 170 federal judges. These are lifetime appointments. He's nominated and gotten confirmed one-fifth of the federal judges. And, 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 and the American Bar Association has come out on a number of these nominations and said these people are totally unqualified to be federal judges. And Republicans led by Senator Moscow and Mitch McConnell in the U.S. Senate have confirmed them anyway. Because Moscow Mitch said that he, he basically said he wants his legacy to be getting confirmed as many right-wing conservative judges, federal judges, as they possibly can. These are lifetime appointments. So when we look, so when we look at this here, we're going to continue and then we'll go back to the phone lines here. Um, bribery. Professor Carlin said that Donald Trump committed what the framers believed was bribery regardless of whether he committed what the current federal criminal code establishes as bribery, quote, when you ask for private benefits in return for an official act or somebody gave them to you in influence, uh, to influence an official act, that was bribery, end quote. Now, Professor uh, Turley, who was brought in by Republicans, argued that, quote, the language of the interpretation of federal courts, end quote, says that Donald Trump did not commit real crimes, a point that a Republican staff lawyer said moved Donald Trump's actions into the category of misdemeanors. In his, uh, so he said this in his prepared opening statement. Foreign interference. Professor Carlin, Pamela Carlin, said the founders were, quote, unquote, especially concerned about foreign election meddling because they had just separated from Great Britain. So the Constitution is signed September 17, 1787. This is basically uh, um, uh, four years after the uh, American Revolutionary War ends, which is uh, 1775 to 1783. Okay? So, you know, you had the Declaration of Independence, 1776. You had the Philadelphia Convention in uh, spring of 1787. And, uh, and, and they're, they're drafting the Constitution and debating different aspects of the Constitution. They separated from King George III, who was the king of Great Britain. So, because they separated, there was a revolution against the British Empire. They're very concerned about foreign interference. This all ties into history. So, uh, Professor Carlin said the founders were especially concerned about foreign election meddling. Donald Trump encouraging Ukraine to dig up dirt on former Vice President Joe Biden, she said, showed Trump's belief in the proprietary, uh, the, sorry, the, pro the propriety of foreign governments intervening, propriety of foreign governments intervening in elections. Foreign governments don't intervene in our elections to benefit us. They intervene to benefit themselves. Now, Professor Turley, who the Republicans brought, cautioned lawmakers against an overly broad interpretation of what he called, quote, betrayal of the national interest, end quote, an offense he said Republicans would have likely accused former President Barack Obama of, quote. That's it, well, you know, Republicans almost won to impeach President Obama for wearing a tan suit. So you, you remember that, right? Quote, that's exactly what James Madison warned you against. 
you would create effectively a vote of no confidence uh, standard in our Constitution, end quote. All right, uh, let's see here. Let's go to the phone lines. When we, go, uh, when we come back from the phone lines, I'm going to go to this next clip here. We'll go to uh, clip number three gotcha. of uh, Nancy Pelosi. Let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to Keith. Uh, Keith, um, line one. Hey, Keith, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from. Hey, what's up, man? I'm calling from Ipsilani. Ipsilani? Okay, okay. Ipsilani, Michigan. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so I guess I'm just wondering, 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 well, what should I believe? We got these black Republicans that are running back to the Democratic Party here in Detroit. Well, well, the Republican Party has always felt the same way about, about them, okay? They were there for the same reason the white folk were, to do not pay taxes, you know, those policies. So how do we know that these black Republicans is jumping straight back into Democratic politics after denouncing the Republican Party, how do we know that's not Trojan horse? Uh, I don't know who you're talking about, but you, you judge it based on a case-by-case -case basis and judge it based upon the policy. I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know who you're referring to. I mean, well, <laughs> well, can I get a name? You know, we got black Republicans that right. uh, just decided, I can't take the Republican Party anymore, so I'm coming back to the Democrats. Oh. We didn't take this intermission. Mm -hmm. We didn't take an intermission or anything to try to read up on democratic policy. Right. Okay. We're right. just jumping straight into politics, jumping straight into democratic politics with a uh, Republican mindset. Right, right. Judge, know, pro probably judge them on that record. Probably judge them on that record. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, judge them, you know, it's so it, it, it's. If they if they jump, just speaking in general, not speaking of anybody specifically, just speaking in general, if they jump one minute from this political party to that political party, to the Republican Party, I'm sure the Democratic Party, after they were spouting Republican ideology, if they were if they were spouting Republican ideology for years, and then they're going to jump to the Democratic Party, I mean, you don't, you have to still judge them on their record, you know. Okay, Keith, I got to go, I get, get these other calls, man. Thanks for calling in, okay? Keep listening. All right, let's go to my man, John. Hey, John, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from, John. Yeah, well, thank you, whole I'm calling from the uh, east side of Detroit. Okay, uh, go ahead. I, I, you know, they, you were calling a random right about cutting off, uh, oh, it's from the thousand people on, on, on some type of, uh... On Snap. Food. On Food Snap. Yeah. So snap, yep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, they're getting a restraint on it. Most of them, and we got entrepreneurs all the time, most of them were white folks. Lot, right, most of them, most of them white, yeah, and a lot of them probably yeah. voted for Donald Trump, and, and this, and 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 this, yeah, and he was uh, saying that you know that like, he was definitely gonna do it, and a lot of them ain't saying that, but I just wondering did, did they get the message or so forth? And, well, it, it's going to kick in in April of 2020. Uh, now this is after this is after Donald Trump gave a 1.4 trillion dollar tax cut to millionaires and billionaires. That's right. That he lied and said was for the middle class, but it wasn't. Okay. Um, and so so now what he's going to do is, is do this. Now the, now what's interesting is um, a lot of the people who are going to be impacted are living in. Uh, states that have a Republican state legislature and Republican yeah. governors. A lot of these poor Republican states like Kentucky, like uh, Alabama, <laughs> Mississippi, states like that, okay? Yeah. So it, it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, the other thing is, is that you have a, a CBS News uh, has the article that deals with how uh, about forty percent, about almost half of Americans are have jobs that are low wage paying jobs. <laughs> that's right. That's okay. Right. okay. So, 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 Trump talks about this great economy, yeah. and he talks about a low unemployment rate, but he doesn't talk about how a lot of these jobs that he's bragging about are low wage paying jobs. So people then have to have two or three jobs. 
Some of them got to get two jobs. They just exactly. Get two jobs. Exactly. All right, John. Okay, keep listening. Okay. okay, okay. Thank you. Keep up the work, man. All right. Okay, all right, let's keep going. Okay, I got to plug in the laptop here. I forgot to plug it in. Okay, uh, I want to go to this uh, clip here. Let's go to this next clip. This is, so, December 5th, Nancy Pelosi announced um, that she was going to move forward, that the House, uh, uh, House uh, Judiciary Committee would move forward with articles of impeachment. Let's go to clip number three here. Good morning. Let us begin where our founders began in 1776. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to, to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another. With those words, our founders courageously began our declaration of independence from an oppressive monarch for among other grievances, the king's refusal to follow rightfully passed laws. In the course of today's events, it becomes necessary for us to address, among other grievances, the president's failure to faithfully execute the law. When crafting the Constitution, the founders feared the return of a monarchy in America. And having just fought a war of independence, they specifically feared the prospect of a king president corrupted by foreign influence. During the Constitutional Convention, James Madison, the architect of the Constitution, warned that a president might betray his trust to foreign powers, which might prove fatal to the Republic. Another founder, Governor Morris, feared that a president may be bribed by a greater interest to betray his trust. He emphasized that this magistrate is not the king. The people are the king. They therefore created a constitutional remedy to protect against a dangerous or corrupt leader. Impeachment. Unless the Constitution contained an impeachment provision, one founder warned, a president might, quote, spare no effort or means whatsoever to get himself reelected. Similarly, George Mason insisted that a president who procured his appointment in his first instance through improper and corrupt acts might repeat his guilt and return to power. During the debate over impeachment at the Constitutional Convention, George Mason also asked, shall any man be above justice? Shall that man be above it who can commit the most extensive injustice? In his great wisdom, he knew that injustice committed by the president erodes the rule of law, the very idea that of fair justice, which is the bedrock of our democracy. And if we allow a president to be above the law, we do so surely at the peril of our republic. In America, no one is above the law. Over the past few weeks, through the Intelligence Committee working with the Foreign Affairs and Oversight Committees, the American people have heard the testimony of truly patriotic career public servants, distinguished diplomats and decorated war heroes, some of the president's own appointees. The facts are uncontested. The president abused his power for his own personal political benefit at the expense of our national security, by withholding military aid and crucial Oval Office meeting in exchange for an announcement of an investigation into his political rival. Yesterday, the Judiciary Committee, at the Judiciary Committee, the American people heard testimony from leading American constitutional scholars who illuminated without a doubt that the President's actions are a profound violation of the public trust. The president's actions have seriously violated the Constitution, especially when he says and acts upon the belief. Article 2 says I can do whatever I want. No. His wrongdoing strikes at the very heart of our Constitution, a separation of powers, three co-equal branches, each a check and balance on the other. A republic, if we can keep it, said Benjamin Franklin. Our democracy is what is at stake. 
the president leaves us no choice but to act because he is trying to corrupt once again the election for his own benefit. One minute. The president has engaged in abuse of power, undermining our national security and jeopardizing the integrity of our elections. His actions are in defiance of the vision of our founders and the oath of office that he takes to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Sadly, but with confidence and humility, with allegiance to our founders and a heart full of love for America, today I am asking our chairman to proceed with articles of impeachment. I commend our committee chairs and our members for their somber approach to actions which, other, which the president had not made necessary. In signing the Declaration of Independence, our founders invoked a firm reliance on divine providence. Democrats, too, are prayerful, and we will proceed in a manner worthy of our oath of office to support and defend the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, foreign and domestic. So help us, God. Thank you. Okay, so that was from Thursday, uh, December 5th. Nancy Pelosi announced that she would uh, direct the uh, House Judiciary Committee to proceed with articles of impeachment against one Donald John Trump. Okay, now this should have happened months ago. I told you that here on the show. After the Mueller report came out, this should have happened then, all right? So, uh, then, later that same day, she did a press conference, uh, and... Uh, a reporter made the bad mistake of asking her this question that Representative Doug Collins of Georgia asked her. Okay, let's go to this clip from Lawrence O'Donnell. Clip five. Okay, we got it coming up. Never seen anything like the most. Finally tonight, it's been a jam-packed and historic week of news with the announcement that the House will draft articles of impeachment against President Trump, as well as Donald Trump's much-discussed NATO summit and Rudy Giuliani's latest ju ju uh, jaunt to Ukraine. But there's one thing that happened this week that cannot be overlooked or lost in the news coverage. I was shocked when I heard it on Tuesday. I said then that it might be one of the most totalitarian life statements issued yet by a member of the Trump. Okay, yeah, never seen anything like Pelosi. Pelosi firing back at conservative reporter. That, that's, that's the clip. And with that, to. Nancy okay. Pelosi guaranteed that Donald Trump will be the third president of the United States. It's impeached by the House of Representatives. The House Judiciary Committee will write and vote on articles of impeachment. Those articles of impeachment will pass in the committee and then be voted on by the full House of Representatives. And some or all of the articles of impeachment will pass the House of Representatives. And Donald J. Trump will take his place in history as an impeached president. We don't yet know the exact timetable for all of that, but it could happen before Christmas. The House Judiciary Committee has its next impeachment hearing scheduled for Monday when they will consider the evidence in the House Intelligence Committee's written report of its impeachment investigation of the president's solicitation of help in his re-election campaign from the president of Ukraine by asking the president of Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden. After making her historic announcement this morning, the Speaker of the House went about her regular duties, including conducting, later, her regularly scheduled press conference about House of Representatives business in which she discussed the 275 bills that she has passed through the House of Representatives with bipartisan votes that are all now on Mitch McConnell's desk in the United States Senate where he is ignoring them and refusing to allow them to come to a vote. And then... When the speaker was leaving that press conference, a reporter decided to shout out a question. The reporter is James Rosen, who spent almost as much time working at Fox News as disgraced sexual predator Bill O'Reilly, and who left Fox News, according to the New York Times, quote, after the network began scrutinizing sexual misconduct allegations against him. James Rosen now works for a much less prominent right-wing so-called news organization, and he asked Nancy Pelosi the kind of question that would have made his former Fox huh? boss, okay. sexual predator Roger Ailes, very, very proud. Thank you. Thank you. Do you hate the president, so to speak? I don't hate anybody. I don't have any friends here. I don't hate anybody. 
not anybody in the world. So don't, don't accuse, accuse me. I did not accuse you. He is, he is. I asked the question. <laughs> Representative Collins yesterday suggested that the Democrats are doing this simply because they don't like the guy. I have nothing to do with it. Let me just say this. I think, it's important. I think the president is a coward when it comes to helping uh, our, our kids who are afraid of gun violence. I think he is cool when he doesn't deal with the, the helping our dreamers, though, of which we're very proud. I think he's in denial about the about the uh, climate crisis. However, that's about the election. This is about the election. Take it up in the election. This is about the Constitution of the United States and the facts that lead to the president's violation of his oath of office. And as a Catholic, I resent your using the word hate in a sentence that addresses me. I don't hate anyone. I was raised in a way that is full, a heart full of love and always prayed for the president. And I still pray for the president. I pray for the president all the time. So don't mess with me when it comes to words like that. Walk away from that microphone and walk out of that room so that you could feel, you could feel the power of the silence that she created in that room. Rooms full of reporters in Washington are never silent. I've never seen anything like that. I've never seen any member of Congress ever leave a room full of tough Capitol Hill reporters in stunned silence. James Rosen cowered in that stunned silence and did not dare throw the word hate at Nancy Pelosi again after she crushed him in front of every other Capitol Hill reporter and now the millions. All right, so <laughs> now I saw it live when it happened because when James Rosen asked that question, I said, uh-oh. Because she, she walked away from the podium and she was talking to him. And then she went, because I, I was saying, go back to the podium. Go back to the podium so we can hear you through the microphone. She went back. Oh, she walked all over her. She walked all over him with her high heel shoes on. Watch that. MSNBC.com. That's from the uh, last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Uh, never seen anything like Pelosi firing back at conservative reporter. I bet you he won't do that again. See, that was that dumb question he asked that uh, uh, Representative Gary Collins of Georgia asked who is the uh, ranking chair of the House Judiciary Committee, okay? He asked that dumb, uh, uh, he went and asked that dumb question about a statement that Doug Collins made, all right? Okay, look, we got to get out of here. Uh, these other uh, topics, I'll get, I'll do a uh, broadcast throughout the week. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Follow us, uh, follow me on my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. If you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network that helps us keep doing the research, finance the show, finance the research, etc. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on the yellow donate button. Stay tuned for Pastor Mo. Remember, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent through the, throughout the diaspora and around the world. Right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next week. Peace.